As a child, one of my most overused phrases, probably equal only to, are we nearly there yet in driving my parents absolutely insane, was, it's not fair. And that's rather the prerogative of the young. Any preference a parent shows, any whiff of favouritism, any way in which a friend seems to be getting a better deal than you, it all seems a great injustice as a child. And that comment would, of course, attract that ever popular parental put down. Life's not fair. But here's the kicker. The young today have every right to say just that. And looking at this audience, there are quite a lot of people who fall in the category I'm thinking of here. So the under 30s today are expected to be the first generation in recent history who will stay poorer than their elders throughout their lives, facing that lovely triple whammy of low wages, high housing costs, and insecure employment. If you're under 27, your generational bequest is pretty diabolical, the hand-me-down from hell. Now, parenthood, generally, and I did do population, this is one of the puzzles, the very basic puzzle of population, is why on earth anyone ever has children? I remember my demography tutor describing it as, and I think he said at the time, £150,000 and 18 years of partial house arrest. It's now £225,000 and still probably actually now about 21 years of partial house arrest. Yet people still do it. And one thing that that means, one thing that they tend to do, something that unites humans across all of history, essentially, and all across the world, is that they have a desire for their children to have a better life than they did. They want their children to struggle less than them. They want them to have advantages they never did. Now, that probably is the parental affliction. But the baby boomers, or generation jammy, as some people have termed them, probably me, uh, have actually broken that. They've sold out their children. Now, it isn't just me who believes this. There's plenty of research on this subject. And the book titles of, of all these books will, will give you a clue. There's the jilted generation. What did the baby boomers ever do for us? And that's by a, a baby boomer called Francis Beckett, who writes, we have squandered the good times. One half of the baby boomers were too busy to notice, the other half too greedy to care. And then perhaps most famously, there's a book called The Pinch, how the baby boomers took their children's future and why they should give it back. Now, that one's particularly interesting because it's by David Willits, who was known, I think, in government as something like Two Brains. And he was the former university secretary. And he was a member of a cabinet who made this worse. But we'll get to that. And even the FT, hardly a paper known for hyperbole, declared last year that, it, that the UK was no country for young men. My dad or young women. Uh, it followed an investigation into the generation that has all these depressing nicknames, the jilted generation, as I've said, generation internship, generation rent, which is pretty depressing to be defined by how uh, you get housing. Anyway, uh, and earlier this year, MPs actually launched an inquiry into, intergen into intergenerational fairness. Now, the fear was that the British state pension and welfare system is unfairly favouring pensioners at the expense of younger workers. Well, duh, of course it is. But before I get to that, I want to bat off an argument that you get a lot in response to saying this, to making this argument. And it's that you're sort of moaning, because life today is a lot better in certain ways than it was for my parents. And I absolutely agree with that. Society has become more liberal and tolerant in its attitude to people's private lives. Uh, we've still got enormous progress to make, but it is better to be gay today, it is better to be a woman, it is better to be trans, it's better to be all sorts of things. Um, and that is progress. And we have iPads and a top shop on every high street. <laughs> but none of that really disproves that there's a terrible generational legacy. And it's what the government and successive governments are doing to the young, and then what they give to the old. Now, if you look at what the young are getting today, we have the educational maintenance allowance being ditched. The young get a lower rate of job seekers allowance than everybody else. And in last year's budget, the government scrapped the automatic entitlement to housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. Now, they did make this exception for vulnerable and other hard cases, 
But as with all these things, that's a fairly difficult thing to prove. Now, I want to look at that particular policy just really quickly. Because there's a real danger with that policy that it forces children to keep living in very difficult circumstances when they're actually no longer children. And Crisis, the homeless charity, predicted at the time that that would unsurprisingly result in an increase in homelessness. And under 25s already make up a third of homeless people in this country. And then, of course, since we're in a university setting, you have the fact that young people, if they do go to university, face stonking fees where others once had grants. And I just wanted to look at one tiny little policy, that, uh, one tiny little prejudice that I think is quite interesting. So a few years back, um, there was a ruling that you could no longer discriminate according to uh, whether on car insurance, whether someone was a man or a woman. And at the time, I remember thinking, so a woman is less likely to have, an uh, to have a car crash um, on average than a man. So they, this was deemed to be unfair. And yet, of course, and I was a young, angry person at the time, and this angered me, you could still discriminate on age. So young people still had to pay more. Nobody thought that that was discriminatory. Now, on top of all this, of course, young people who will be facing later, much later retirement than previous generations, they're being priced out of home ownership, and they're drowning in debt, both public and personal, uh, they then have to pick up the bill for the baby boomer generation when they retire. Oh, it's a joy to be young. And then turn to looking at that older generation. Well, Cambridge probably came for free for them. Uh, they had very nice final pension schemes that we've been uh, shut out of. And when they, became pen when they become pensioners, they still get their free buses, bus passes and TV licenses. And that is not determined by how wealthy they are. And undoubtedly, I would just, as an aside, point out, there are uh, undoubtedly pensioners in poverty. But as a group on the whole, uh, their wealth has increased uh, as, as a proportion of our wealth as a nation, uh, as obviously other people's has declined. And let's look at cuts and austerity. Well, that is where they've been ring fenced. Uh, the state pension has kept rising with, the, with this triple lock that, the that you hear a lot about, uh, which essentially means that it will rise by whichever of uh, the three is the greatest. So uh, either the inflation rate, which is based on the consumer prices index, uh, the increase in average earnings, or 2.5%, the highest of those three. Now, what I particularly wanted to look at is housing, because this is one of the areas, or probably the area, where this is all most brutal. And once we were called a nation of shopkeepers, and now I sort of think the baby boomers, at least, have wanted us to become a nation of homeowners because it became this sort of crazy obsession. If you looked at TV, for example, you know, there were all these programs about buying houses, upgrading your house, uh, location, location, location. I mean, all of this is sort of a cult of it. And you look at that, so all that is going on, and yet the young are priced ever further out of that unless, of course, they have a donation from the bank of mum and dad, as it became known. And that, of course, perpetuates a very different kind of, of inequality. And what happened, obviously, is that some people made their fortunes out of their houses. They expected their house to make money in a way that previous generations have not. And they also, in some cases, actually found that their home was making more money, and this is still true in London, in parts of London now, people's homes are making more money each year than they are. Now, what I did, what is a sort of smug little thing to note on this, is that actually this became a problem for this spoilt, spoilt generation too. Because, of course, if it's harder for young people to get on the housing ladder, it's, far hard, it's much harder for parents to boot their children out of home too. And one of the things that I noted uh, as a 20-something columnist, I'm now 31, but was a number of people, uh, sort of 50-something columnists, who would write 
that they wanted to kick their children out of their homes for their own good. A sort of don't darken my doorway attitude. Uh, but they were failing to see that they, with their, uh, with their you know, how homes worth probably now in the uh, high hundreds of thousands, if not perhaps uh, millions, uh, low millions, uh, they were the architect of their children's plights. And over the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about affordable housing. Now, that term has been so overused by uh, politicians that it's become almost meaningless. Um, I was reading something where a mayoral, uh, a candidate for London mayor, believed that a home of 400, I think, 50,000 was affordable. Um, now, the basic measure of affordability, though, clearly uh, is housing costs relative to income. And the UK, not just London, this is the UK uh, in totality, is internationally classified as seriously unaffordable. London's probably, obviously, the most uh, famous example of that. But in Cambridge, um, prices are more than 10 times uh, income. House prices are more than 10 times uh, average income. And I've sort of looked and studied why politicians do so little about this. And last year, in his speech at uh, Tory party conference, David Cameron did at least acknowledge the plight of generation rent. And what he did, rather typically, was again offer a wrong solution. He talked about starter homes. And what that meant was developers who would previously have offered low-cost properties for the rental market could instead now sell homes at a discount of 20% to the market, uh, which would be reserved for first-time buyers under the age of 40. And the plan, therefore, is to turn renters into owners. And that doesn't sound bad until you saw a map that the housing charity Shelter made, which showed where in the UK these starter homes would be affordable for low-income families. And that was nowhere in London at all, and really not many places in the whole of the UK. And according to their analysis, you'd need to earn £77,000 to buy a so-called starter home in London. So who's that really going to help? Well, that's going to help a few high earners who would have been able to get on the property of ladder eventually anyway. Now, as a Londoner, that probably is the biggest issue. And there's one really, one little sort of snippet that I thought was really telling about how uh, my city has changed. And it was a piece of election analysis just before last year's general election. It was in a restaurant review. And it was by Giles Corran in the Times. And what he noted was on his salary 30 or 40 years ago, he would have been able to afford a house in Kensington rather than Kentish Town. And his offspring, and this is very Giles Corran in tone, would be down for Eton, not the local state primary. And his point was that even people like him were being priced out. And that was how unequal London society had become because of it being a financial, a financial sque a centre squeezing everybody else out. Now, a world in which even a Corran feels poor is a pretty troubling one. So one of the questions Barbara asked me when we chatted before this was, why has capitalism ended up producing this level of inequality? And I'm not sure we can entirely blame capitalism for this. There's a demographic element to this problem, clearly. Um, the baby boomers are a big generation in sheer numbers, which makes them a pretty powerful electoral force. Which brings me to the question of, do we blame democracy? Because they're electorally powerful, uh, known sometimes as the grey vote, um, people are very afraid, uh, governments are very afraid of doing anything that might upset them. But this, I think, partly also offers us a bit of a solution. Because we often hear about how the young are apathetic and they don't vote, which I've always thought is, is rather unfair and simplistic. But... There is a point in that the more that the young remove themselves from the political system, the easier they become to ignore. And the reason the baby boomers could pick up, kick up such a stink over issues like the so-called granny tax was because of their electoral might. So what do we do? And one thing that I actually think would really help, that's very simple, would be a form of electoral reform, or voting reform, rather. And that would be 
bringing in a system that actually seems modern as opposed to our rather dated uh, paper ballot for which we have this sort of lingering nostalgic affection. And so I thought we could have an app or something called Voter, obviously with no E in it, um, as is the way. Um, and then instead of going to the polling booth in the rain, we could have actually a modern system that was a bit more like how we bank. And lots of people always insult this idea because they say, oh, it's a civic sacrament and we don't want it brought down to the level of the X factor. But actually, I would argue democracy is far more seriously debased by low voter turnout. And perhaps, of course, and David Cameron was one of the people who was most opposed to us having any kind of um, electronic voting, he would have a different view if it weren't younger voters who were alienated by the current system, who are, of course, the part of the electorate less likely to vote for him. Now, that's one sort of, that's one answer. You can see, actually, that there is a movement recognising this, and I think the success of Bernie Sanders in the US is a sign of that, and probably to a slightly lesser extent, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK winning, um, winning the Labour uh, leadership contest. But I also think there's a broader point, which is attitudinal. And one of the things that's most marked about housing is that actually we've, young people have effectively been uh, infected with older people's obsession. And so we focus a lot on making things better and making it easier to buy. But this is a really British obsession. And we could look to the continent, where actually renting, you rent under much, much better terms, and think, well, maybe that actually isn't such a terrible system. What we could be trying to call for is something much broader. So we'd be rejecting that cult of home ownership that has become so pervasive in our society. And I do sometimes think that with young, with, I, I look at my friends and I think, you know, my parents had this sort of great 60s free love thing going on. And what we all want is a really fuddy-duddy fantasy of a mortgage and a two-decade-long retirement. And I keep thinking that we could be calling for greater change, not simply accepting those values that are handed down to us. And who knows, that might stop our children one day resenting us in the way we might our parents. <laughs>